Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. My name's Marissa. I'm a museum educator with the Lacey Museum. Raise your hand if you've been there before. All right, a lot of you. I've seen a lot of repeat faces in here that have seen me at the Sasquatch Revealed exhibit. So if you've been already, welcome here. Thanks for coming. Uh, for all of you folks who haven't been to the Lacey Museum before, we do have a traveling exhibit called Sasquatch Revealed. It's all the way from Canada. The curator is Christopher Murphy, and we are open Wednesdays through Saturdays, 10 to 4. So hopefully we will see each and every single one of you there by the end of the summer. So we'll go ahead and move on to some business here. Uh, if you haven't already, please take an evaluation form. We will be starting our history tours, our talks, excuse me, in the fall. So we want to really make sure we're a well-oiled machine by then. So if you could all take one of those and fill it out by the end for me, I would really, really appreciate it. A uh, few events coming up on this Saturday. We have Seeking Sasquatch. So it'll be a kid-focused uh, citizen science-based tour. Uh, walking through the Gwenwood Forest at the Conference Center. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what you would do if you saw a Sasquatch uh, and some few helpful tips and tricks and the best way to learn how to be a citizen scientist. Uh, you can register for that until 5 p.m. on Friday. So if you have any little ones in your life who might be interested, uh, just let me know and I can point you in the right direction. Uh, Sunday, August 4th, we're all also having the Thurston Throwback at the Thurston County Fair. So please come see me there as well. Love to see you. Uh, um, also, we have these t-shirts on pre-order. So if you would like, we have a little sign-up sheet up there in the end. So we're in the process of getting the ball rolling there. Thank you for all those who have been asking us about those t-shirts. So thank you for your patience. We, we hear you. We're moving as fast as we possibly can. We promise. Um, and last things last, make sure before you end here, grab a sticker and uh, please silence your cell phones. I know it's an easy thing for us all to forget. <laughs> On to Ryan. So our wonderful host today, Ryan Leisinger. He's been a Washington State resident since he was 10 years old and a Bigfoot enthusiast for several years longer than that. In 2013, Ryan had the idea to build a website localized to Bigfoot activity, events, culture, and history here in Washington State. Ryan launched WashingtonBigfoot.com and started building a community of individuals interested in Washington's favorite cryptid. Ryan is the father of three boys, who I'm sure you'll all meet by the end of this. They're lovely, and works for the state of Washington in information technology. He lives in Olympia and enjoys camping, hiking, and cooking, and of course, finding Sasquatch. Welcome, Ryan. Awesome. Well, we got to use some mic. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, for braving the rain potential flooding. It was horrible today. Everyone was awesome coming out. Thank you so much. It's great to see everybody. Who am I? Why, why, why am I the one up here talking to you about Bigfoot? As we heard, I'm a Bigfoot enthusiast. I like the word enthusiast because it kind of describes it. Am I a researcher? I don't know. I'm not really out there collecting data. Sometimes I come across data, but that's not what I do. Am I a armchair Bigfoot person, I'm definitely not a Bigfoot hunter. I don't really like the hunt term to associate with Bigfoot. Uh, I know people kind of get into that, but I, I'll stay away from the hunter. Enthusiast, I like Bigfoot, it's, it's, a, it's a thing. I have three boys, I live in Washington State. I'm the creator of three different Bigfoot sites. So WashingtonBigfoot.com is the site that I'm, I'm normally talk, they're talking about, and it's the one I put the most energy into it. The other website that I have is a site called Sasquatch Ploitation, and it's just about kind of the exploitation of Bigfoot and Sasquatch and how they're kind of interestingly used sometimes. And I don't get too far into that one, but it's kind of fun. And then the other one is that I do have a feminist Bigfoot research organization because I don't think there's enough women being represented in the Bigfoot world, and I think that's something that's really important, and I think that's something that I can do and that people will you know, kind of get in. Again, I don't put a bunch of energy into the other two, but, but I do have them, and they are fun, and I kind of keep them up as well. 
So as soon as we start talking about Washington State and Bigfoot, we have to talk about this, this, this data that we always see thrown out, and that's that Washington State has more reports than any other state. The two pieces of data that we're going to look at right now is the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO, largest database that's been out there. They've been collecting information for a very, very long time. They have two different databases that they use. They have a public, first of all, is there anyone from BFRO here? Good. So <laughs> they have two different databases that we can use and, and that they talk about. And this one is this database that you'll find online. You go to their site. You can look it up. You can look it up by state, by, by region, by county. You can break it down. They have all this data that they, they kind of give out publicly. According to that data, Washington has either 659 or 666, depending on which way you, you, which database you look at. But they basically have, we have the most reports in this. They collect this data by, by collecting reports and then confirming them. They have people that they are trusted individuals who contact the people who would give the reports. And for one reason or another, they confirm that report. And that report gets put into this database. Recently, in March of this year, is the first time I ever saw these numbers, but they'd been out there for a while and people had been talking about them. They have another database that's called the Follow-Up Log and Tracking System. This is all of the reports that get sent to them. Again, the ones that they post on their site are only a slice of that. Here's the numbers that come in different, though. Of, they have 659 state confirmed sightings. They have over 2,000 Washington state sightings that have never been confirmed. The states line up fairly close based on when you go from database to database, California comes in with the second uh, on both. Oregon is not the second on the, on the one database, but it is this other. But the idea is something is different about Washington state. For some reason, we have more sightings. We don't have more space. We definitely don't have more people. We do have more people in urban areas who are then uh, uh, associated with forest and rural areas. You look at the California numbers and some pieces like that, the California numbers are way off, the, off, off towards people living in urban areas and not being really exposed to these other ones. But there's also a lot more people and there's a lot more area. There's something different about Washington State if you start to slice the data. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at two different aspects of what could kind of influence that. We're going to look at some historical stuff. I'm going to buzz through some historical, the kind of my favorite historical pieces of, of Bigfoot in Washington State. And we're going to look at some cultural pieces as well. A lot of these historical ones, we could sit down and talk for an hour about any one of them. There are stories on stories, and the rumors have stories, and the reports have sightings, and they go in every direction in all sorts of ways. I tried to pull out some of the important information that, that kind of is attached to them to talk about them a little bit, to kind of anchor them in a timeline of some big events that have occurred in Washington state associated with, with Bigfoot. I did not tie them into other things that were going on in the world at the time. I tried to keep them very localized. And we could talk about uh, Bigfoot showing up on TV in, in popularity here. And in that, did that increase sightings here or increase the fr frequency of things here? I didn't get too far into that. I just wanted to lay out a timeline. So interestingly enough, Pierce County, Pierce County has 80 sightings, reports, in the public database. That's more than 26 states in the United States. That's Pierce County and with the most. So just to give you an idea, if Pierce County was its own state, they'd be right there in the, in the middle of the states. Why is that? What, what, what's the difference? What's, the, what's these determining factors that, that why are these coming in in Washington state so much? I don't know, but we're going to talk about some things that might be an influence in them. Bigfoot's protected in two counties in Washington state. I can't find another county in the whole US that has protected status on Bigfoot. If you know of one, tell me. I can't find them. There's two counties. Both of them reference Sasquatch. 
The first one, the, the, the Scamania one, is kind of interesting because I will say this was posted on April 1st, 1969. Anything that happens on April 1st is a little bit suspect, but it was updated in 1984 and is actually a, a, an ordinance on the books. And you can look it up and we can look at it and all these things, it's there. That one is the one that people talk about a lot, but then after looking for these a bit, I found that Whatcom County also has a resolution, not an ordinance, but a resolution protecting Bigfoot in the, in the, the county as well. Again, we're starting to look at maybe why Washington's a little different. <laughs> the first European sighting I could find, there is some references I find now and then of 1947 of a gentleman um, talking to the indigenous people here and, and hearing about something that sounds like Bigfoot. The first sighting I can find itself is from a Secretary of State book that's compiled, it's called Told by the Pioneers. And it's this, this, this report that's on the side, and it's from either 1850 or 1852. The story is told by the granddaughter, but basically her grandfather would tell this story that, that he had encountered these things. This is the first, the first sighting, the first report that I can find. But for thousands of years previous to that, there's tons of evidence that the indigenous people who, who have inhabited Washington state had this in their culture already. Words that we use, the word Sasquatch is from a Salish. There's, there's all these cultures. There was a great exhibit up north at the Muckleshoot Casino, uh, I think last summer, just the previous summer, that had a lot of great information about this. And it's, it's, there's a ton of information in here as well. But the idea is, this thing that's in Washington state did not start in 1957 with the first, you know, the first concept of Bigfoot or with the Patterson Gimbel films or any of these things as well, or even with, with, with European settlers coming here. This was already going on in our space previous to that. We're looking at something that that has influenced our culture, that has kind of permeated the, the, the way that we, we talk and we look at things and the stories that we tell. This existed thousands of years before white settlers came here. John Muir, he climbed uh, Mount Rainier in 19, or sorry, 1888. On researching this, I found that John Muir was actually a really horrible person. He was a naturalist, but he was not a good guy. Um, he had some very close-minded and, and, and uh, some, some views on who should be allowed into national parks and who should have access to these things that, that do not jive with me today. But the interesting piece that comes into that is not him himself, but his guide. His guide for this 1988, or sorry, 1888 climb was a man named E.S. Ingram, who was a Seattle local. E.S. Ingram is on the books repeatedly talking about, about uh, this race of individuals who live under Mount Rainier in the cave systems. And even himself saw several times what he called the old, what is it, the old man of the crater, where he would describe this, this, this being that sounds a lot like a, like a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot kind of sighting. So I have a hard time believing that, that his guide himself, who took him up there for the very first time, did not influence and talk to Muir about these things and how this went. Uh, E.S. Ingram was very, very vocal about talking about, about these kind of things. So we go very far back to, to the 1888, you know, early, early, early times. The Ape Canyon 1924 report it captures people's imaginations. And this is such kind of this landmark, amazing time in, in Washington State Bigfoot history. Uh, the story basically goes, five miners uh, go up towards Spirit Lake uh, outside of Kelso, and they have this encounter, this, this overnight kind of encounter where they actually shoot a, a Bigfoot type creature. Um, they are uh, pinned down inside of a house. There's rocks maybe thrown at them. There's all this drama. They somehow survive the night. They get out, they shoot another one, or however the story goes. They on their way down, they tell the story. Within several days, this is in the Portland paper, this is in Seattle papers, this is covered. Kind of a cool thing, this happened 95 years ago 
probably this week. Uh, they won't give an exact date, and I can't really find an exact date on it, but the first newspaper reportings on this started to show up on July 13th. So the estimates of the nights that this occurred was somewhere between the 6th and the 10th. Uh, if it happened on the 10th, it, it was fairly rapid to get to the newspapers in three days. But we are talking about 95 years ago, this sensational story that was brought back. And the story was 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 presented at that time. It's, and, and it's been confirmed and kind of grown on. In uh, 1967, the man Fred Beck, who's the one miner that's been identified, uh, wrote a little book trying to kind of, uh, I'll, I'll say, probably you know, monetize some of the Bigfoot stuff that was going on in that time. 1967 kind of lines up with a lot of stuff that was going on. But the idea was that this story was delivered when they came down in 1924. And there are newspaper articles to deliver this. This is one of the great stories of, of, of kind of Washington State Bigfoot. It is a little violent compared to a lot, a lot of the information, but I think that's what captures a lot of people's imagination in it. And it's an interesting and great one to look up. We'll jump forward, 1967. So now we're several, we're, we're several years after the, the Patterson Gimbal film stuff going on. Bigfoot's starting to show up on TV. We're talking more and more about Bigfoot and Sasquatch. And there's this very interesting uh, a report and kind of set of reports that happen in the, in the winter of, of, of 1969. The interesting thing is it happens in Bossburg, uh, uh, Washington, which the most population I can ever find that the town had was 800 people. This isn't where I would go to to do an elaborate hoax or to try and like get into this whole thing because there's a good chance that no one would have ever found what was found there. And it basically comes down to that there was a set of prints found and there was consistently deformity in one of the sides and one of the feet of the prints. And this was interesting. Uh, if you do a hoax, why do you put a deformity into it? Are you actually that clever about, uh, you, about building up your hoax to it? And it's a very interesting story. And it actually went for like a month or so and started to attract some attention and started to attract some, some Bigfoot researchers. And upon right at the end of the year, there were 1,089 additional prints that were found. And a great deal of them also had this deformity that went along to it. These casts still exist. They were confirmed. They've been looked at many, many times since then. But this is an interesting one in the Washington State history line, just because of if it's going to be a hoax, why do you do it that way, and, 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 and how it came about. A year later, well, actually, not even a year later, only, only six or seven months later, Washington State's governor wrote and signed an executive order making Bigfoot our state monster. A little piece of the, the piece in there. Anyone can go and find this. Secretary of State has all these things. It had a hair sample attached to it that he asked be tested. Um, it references an RCW, which is the basis of Washington state law that doesn't exist, interestingly enough. But just for a governor to write up an executive order, send it out, sign it, and get it out there in publication is an interesting cultural piece. Dan Evans uh, was an outdoorsman, he, or sorry, is an outdoorsman, uh, is very active in kind of those kind of things. but not necessarily a practical joker. To do this, he was, he was trying to kind of, kind of get things stirred up. He had a plenty active uh, governor's uh, 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 job as a governor. He didn't really need that much more. Now, while the executive order is a lot of fun, the best part of this is to look on the Secretary of State who do the archiving site and watch the comments from his cabinet as they start to get the memos about this. And there's comments, and they're all handwritten, because it's 1970, and they're funny, and it's like, uh, you know, Martha, go pull me the Bigfoot file, da 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 da, -da. And, he, and you know, these kind of things, you know, look up everything, go to the library and get everything we have on Bigfoot, and that's his attorney general or something, probably making a joke about if this is actually a law or not. But this idea that, that a governor would do this, I think, says something about Washington State, and it's fun, but 
he's 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 putting himself out there a little bit. He's 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 presenting himself as someone who's willing to kind of get out there and talk about Bigfoot. Five years after that comes a very, very interesting document. So University of Washington Environmental Studies and the Army Corps of Engineers get together and they build a, a book and it's a, it's a big leather kind of bound book and it's printed out and it's the Washington State Environmental Atlas. Other states had done this in a couple of years, span right there, you get the money together, you get a grant to do it and such and a university assists you. And this all went good and, good and fine, and it gives some kind of geographical information about uh, Washington State, and it gets into the animal section. And the very last post on the animal section is Sasquatch. Um, it's listed as Sasquatch as an important animal. And it makes a little joke about it a little bit. And I have a digital copy of this. And anyone else, um, if you've contacted me, I will give you the digital copy of it. It's a single half of a page on, on, this, uh, on this atlas. But the idea that, again, they would include this into a kind of government paid for document, I think is awesome. And it just, it's it, the, the chart on the side, the state chart gives a set of uh, sightings that they kind of had and had collected at that time and have been floating on in a database. There's a drawing as well that is also featured in, I think it's a Lewis County newspaper um, uh, drawing from a newspaper as well and some prints, but, and then there's some text below and there's even a funny little cartoon included in the bottom. But the idea that Washington State would find it important enough to include Sasquatch in their very important animals, I think just says a lot about the culture, a lot about the state. Interestingly enough, some of you may have seen uh, a month ago maybe, there was a reference, uh, there's some FBI files that were released and it was one of the first uh, sets of record releases from someone requesting that the FBI test some uh, hair and some DNA samples uh, to, that they, the person believed was Bigfoot. And this document is actually referenced in those FBI files. Those also are available online to check out if you want. But it's kind of interesting to see this document be pulled up in this kind of historical sense uh, every now and then, and people kind of talk about it. Some people want to say, oh, it's proof of Bigfoot because the government knows. So, so I work for state government. And I don't really think we're hiding that much stuff. I can't say for the feds themselves, but state government, we're, we're working hard to, to, to get stuff out the door. Um, there's not, as far as I can tell, elaborate conspiracy theories hiding documents and pieces like that. Um, again, I can't speak for the feds, I can't speak for other things, but I work for state government and, and I'm telling you what I see. So this is interesting. This was uh, highly influenced by the University of uh, Washington, their environmental studies, who kind of drew, drove this kind of direction as well. But I think it's a really important document. And it's just, it's fun. It is at some libraries. Uh, uh, the, there are some libraries, some of them have them available to see, and some of them do not let people view them just because they're not in curated state or whatever. The one that belongs to the library system that we are in, they have at least one copy, but it is locked up right now. They're working on curating it. 1980, big event. Heard all around the world, this huge er eruption happens on Mount St. Helens, this is this huge thing. And stories start developing from this around the US, uh, the National Guard, or the Army Corps of Engineers, kind of depending on, on, on what you're hearing in that way, that there was the disposal of multiple Bigfoot bodies. And a lot of these stories are interesting. Another one that is, 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 is a great story, to kind of hear it laid out, to hear kind of how the different parts go down. There are several different versions. There were people who worked for the forestry department who saw something. There was a man who saw a helicopter fly by with a net full of Bigfoot parts. I mean, it's sensational, <laughs> sensational storytelling and great, great stuff. But the idea that there's this <coughs> cataclysm and yet, we were able to work Bigfoot into the storyline. It's just phenomenal and amazing. I think 60 people, 59 people died, and, and it's, it's, it's this tragedy, and yet there's these underlying Bigfoot stories that come out of it, and 
that is this kind of Washington state culture and this historical factor that we just kind of roll in. Again, if you want to read more about any of these, they're available, go find them. We'll talk about them. I have a lot posted on the site, but, but understand that, that anything happens and we somehow are able to kind of wedge Bigfoot into the storyline. Jumping forward to 2000, the Skookum cast. The Skookum cast, a Bigfoot research organization, actually was out, out, out doing uh, filming for a, a, a series, I think, called Animal X. And I don't know if it ever was released or not. But they were actually setting up these little kind of trap-esque things to try and get Bigfoot prints and test these different things. And they came out to one of their areas, some mud, and found what they believed was a full body print of a Sasquatch or Bigfoot that had kind of kneeled down in this kind of interesting arm, elbow, hip, buttocks kind of thing that you can kind of see laid out there next to, to Dr. Meldrum. And this is one of those interesting ones because we just talk about maybe footprints and maybe an occasional handprint, some claw marks sometimes come up or something to that degree. But I can't really find a lot of other near scientific type evidence of a full body print or a partial body print. And the amount of analysis that's gone into testing what this is, is it an elk? Was it an elk knuckle as it rolled over and tried to get the, I don't know what they were using as bait that day, Rolos or apples or something. And, 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 and kind of how this went. The other piece is the cast that they pulled out of here was a 400 pound piece of plaster. It's three and a half by five foot and, and it's enormous and it's gone under amazing scrutiny. And they've just looked at it kind of so many times in so many ways. And I think this is a really interesting one. It also occurred in the Skookum Meadow, which Skookum, as we mentioned a little earlier, is a indigenous word that is also often associated with uh, uh, Bigfoot, uh, the Skookum Truck Reservoir that up on the other side of the hills always is, is, has a lot of sightings and a lot of pieces of that from the, coming up from the south direction as well. So this word Skookum is just kind of interesting in how often it kind of comes up when you're looking at Bigfoot information. We'll jump forward to 2017. 2017 was the first time that I saw legislative action on Bigfoot bills. The first one came up with Ann Rivers, uh, also from down south. Uh, she got a letter. This is the story. She got a letter. And the letter was proposing that we make uh, Bigfoot the Washington State cryptid. Uh, the Washington State dance is square dancing. He wanted the Washington State cryptid to be Bigfoot. And she took this on. She wrote up the bill. She got a couple other senators to kind of get on, on line with it. And, and it kind of went out. It went to committee and died in committee very, very quickly the first time. But it has been brought up every subsequent year since then. This will pass. This will be something that sooner or later will have a legislative session that's boring enough that we can get this through, because it will be able to get kind of enough, enough fervor around it. So interestingly enough, also in 2018, a bill came up to make a Washington State-themed license plate. Uh, this year, the Storm, the, the, the basketball team, they got their themed license plate, and it went through. The last two sessions, they've been, they've been interested in trying to get a Bigfoot-themed one. This year, they even developed it a little further. The money from it would go to the Washington State Parks. I was at two of the hearings when they talked about this. And to hear the parks people get up and say that they agreed with the bill because they wanted some more money was just a beautiful thing. <laughs> Watching the committee members kind of go back and forth and want to kind of laugh about it and maybe make fun of each other for bringing it up and wanting to do it was kind of interesting. And, and, and what I think is it's going to take more of that, where they've heard about it enough times, they're not embarrassed to get up there and talk about it, and kind of just work this through. The license plate bill this year made it all the way to the Senate floor. 
it did not get uh, voted on. It, all, it was available, it was in the stack of bills that they could have pulled and they decided not to pull it. Um, that, that's what happens to bills, they just die at a certain point. But the idea is, every, if you watch a bill and it goes further each time and it takes a step each time, you're thinking it's gonna keep going and taking these additional steps. If it could have gone out to the Senate floor, I have zero doubt that because the storm bill got passed uh, three days uh, previous to that, it would have been voted on, it would have passed, and then it goes over to the other side for them to figure out um, the representative side to do the same thing with. But we will have Bigfoot themed license plates, and it's gonna take a few more years as long as these same representatives kind of keep going on it. I talked with a couple of them, they think it's funny, uh, but then they look at the, the Office of Financial Management says, yeah, the Parks Department could pull in X number of dollars, and they say, hmm, okay. Maybe this isn't such a, 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 a fun thing to do or a loony thing to do, and then maybe it's kind of fun. So I think this is something we're going forward. But remember, I don't know other states in the union that have Washington themed legislative going through. There's one other one that I could find, and that was Arizona passed a bill that the colleges couldn't spend money on Bigfoot research. Um, and that was because they had some uh, professors doing state college classes that I think were just big camping trips. And um, so that, that's the only other kind of Bigfoot legislation I can find kind of at that level. But understand, this is going through our legislative right now. Your representatives right now are having access to these kind of things. If you ever see one, if you ever talk to one, bug them about it a little bit and make them know that this is something we would do. Uh, I ran some informal polling on my Twitter and my site and my Facebook when this was coming up. License plates were the most popular things that people wanted to see. People actually wanted their, their Washington State Bigfoot themed license plates. So that's kind of this history part and kind of this, this quick run through. This isn't everything. We could have put six things between every one of them that I had out here. We could have talked about so many more. I picked out some big ones kind of spanning through time with the idea that this is just part of Washington state. This is ingrained kind of culturally into the state. Not an often seen photo. In fact, I might be the only one with it. Several years ago, uh, so Inslee uh, has a, and, and all the governors have uh, recently have had a Halloween party and they had this kind of mountaineering theme, camping theme, and a Yeti, Bigfoot, showed up at the party. I honestly don't even know if anyone knew who it was, but it was kind of how it all mixed together. The reactions of people at this, it was very fun. It was very kind of, kind of rolled together. And the idea that this was just kind of a norm at the governor's Halloween party is just something that I think also says this is still something for our state. We're still talking about this. This is culturally part of who we are and what we do. The branding, the, 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 the way that, that companies have taken Bigfoot and, and rolled them up into what they are. Sometimes very subtly, sometimes very obviously. Here's three of examples. There's dozens. There's, there's dozens. There's dozens of restaurants, bars, and, and, and other places that have these. Cascadia Grill here in Olympia has, uh, I've been to multiple things there, their arts walk, their some other events, and they have a gentleman, and I believe he's the owner, who dresses in a Bigfoot suit and hangs out there that night. And it is a draw. It is something they like. Their mural on the side has Mount Rainier in the huge Mount Rainier with a UFO over it and a little Bigfoot walking through the forest below. They, they do Bigfoot carvings. They sell carvings from a, gentleman, a local gentleman who does carvings, and they have these carvings up that you can buy. This is just kind of incorporated into kind of how they are and who they are. Uh, over in Tumwater, there's a bar called the Pints Bar. Again, not necessarily really Bigfoot themed, but they have Bigfoot statues in the back of their outdoor seating area. And it's just kind of incorporated into how they are. The Timber Monster Brewing Company in Sultan, a uh, very small area, but there's a brewing company that's there. They've themed their entire thing around Bigfoot. And it's just part of how they've kind of rolled it all together.
So you kind of say, okay, what is culture? How does culture kind of impact and how do we see it and where do we see culture kind of come through? And this is a really interesting one to kind of, kind of think about how it kind of goes through. And that's the idea that uh, before the Sonics left in, in 2008, they had a Sasquatch that was their mascot. And that was just how it was. He jumped through fiery hoops and slammed basketballs. He did backflips off of step ladders and slammed basketballs. He was all over. And it was just yeah, the supersonics, the airplane, the kind of kind of nod to Boeing. But then you incorporate Sasquatch into it and, and, and kind of get that kind of earthier uh, Bigfoot kind of Washington part into it as well. In 2013, Olympia Beer, having had left, moved to Texas by at this time, but still focused on Olympia, ran a contest with the whole million dollar prize for the proof of, of Bigfoot. And this uh, ad campaign where they released a 24 ounce can of Olympian, and uh, they called it the Bigfoot. And you'll s still see some of these posters and some of these artifacts out and around. I've actually talked to Miller Brewery. They don't have them or claim not to have any, any backup or, or any pieces of them. I do have some digital copies that I was able to obtain of them. But the idea was that they went into this huge branding piece. Uh, there was a huge billboard through Lacey of it at, at one point. Um, they are still a sign in Dirty Dave's Pizza. They, st they kept one of the, the footprints that that the signs were all printed out on. You'll see this orange Bigfoot branding that Olympia did. And they ran the campaign for about a year. Um, and it was pretty interesting. So that brings us to uh, the, the idea that uh, several years ago, legalizing marijuana in the state, uh, there was a place called Dank's Wonder Emporium. And what they actually started to do is incorporate Bigfoot into their commercials. And it's kind of an interesting twist on it. And it's fun. But the idea is that 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 they're, they, they're willing to kind of go there and roll this in and make this part of who they are and what they do. That's a, a shot from our TV screen because these often come up and before my kids' YouTube videos for some strange reason. Um, <laughs> but the idea is, is, is just that they kind of have these humorous commercials. And these are all localized. You can look and find across the nation, you find tons of kind of Sasquatch, uh, not tons, but you find kind of more and more Sasquatch commercials. But these are very, very localized. Still going with the concept of imagery, this connection between Washington State and Bigfoot is something that just keeps coming up. Uh, Bigfoot State of Washington shirt, uh, it's existed for I don't know how long. It's been out there. I've seen people wear it. I've seen multiple copies of it. But the idea that there's this bonding between Washington State the statues and the space needles. I actually came back from a trip that I'd been at back east, and on my way walking back through the Seattle airport, saw these little trinkets down on the back, and I was like, oh, I'm home. You know, <laughs> I, I just came back from Iowa where they would have had corn and, I don't know, pigs. And, and now I get, you know, I, now I get Bigfoot and, and the space needle. But this is the imagery. This is, these are the two icons that they chose to represent uh, of, of Washington in this. And the other one is a mug that, that I've seen online but has existed for quite a while. And that's this Bigfoot country and, and Washington State mug that's out there. And it has a little quote on the back. But just the understanding that the imagery, the marketing, this, the, the fact that we can sell these things, I've seen Bigfoot trinkets uh, at the, on the keychain list at Fred Meyers. Um, more and more places, you just see it everywhere. And now that we're talking about it, you'll see it more and more and more. But it is all the freak over. So when I was going to, uh, I was going to one of the hearings about um, about the Bigfoot uh, license plate law. And I reached out to Lauren Coleman. Lauren Coleman is the owner and curator of the biggest cryptid museum in probably in the United States. It's in Portland, Maine. But he has a, this rich, rich, rich background in Bigfoot across the entire nation and has all this wealth of information. And I said, Lauren, can I get a quote? If I get a chance to kind of go up there and say something, can I get a quote from you, someone who, who has seen all these kind of different things about Washington State. And his quote was, the historical significance of Washington State's Bigfoot goes back to the 18th century Skookum and continues up to today's crypto tourism of Bigfoot gifts, statues, and tours. And that's Lauren Coleman of the International Cryptology Museum. And the other side is the, 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 the list of the reports based on the BFR data that I found. The idea is that 
it isn't just Washington State that knows that Washington State is Bigfoot Central. This is known around the, the Bigfoot communities, and it has become such an interesting piece. Interestingly enough, there are very few finding Bigfoot, a show that ran, I think, nine seasons, eight or nine seasons on, on, on TV. There are very few Bigfoot uh, shows for theirs about Washington. They're mostly in other places. And I don't, I've, I've asked a couple times why that is. I've never gotten a, a square answer back concerning it. But this idea is, is, is that people all around the United States they know that this is kind of the central people who are watching this as well. So it's just part of Washington state and it's kind of just ingrained into us and just watch the culture It ebbs and flows. It's had its times when it's been popular and less popular. And we're at a time right now where I, I kind of keep always thinking, oh, the bubble's going to burst and we're going to going to have less and less of this. But I think 50 people showed up to hear me talk about Washington Bigfoot on a rainy Wednesday afternoon, and I don't think we're even near the bubble bursting. I think more people are talking about it, and just kind of, kind of, just it's fun. It's funner to kind of talk about and believe than 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 you know to to have kind of any other stances on it. So people ask me if 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 I believe in Bigfoot, I say, ah, oh, you know, I you know, what, what was the the quote? The gentleman asked me. Oh, the gentleman said, I've lived in Washington for 20 years. I've never seen Bigfoot. I go out all the time. I go out looking for it all the time. And I said, really? I, I see Bigfoot all the time. I, we have dozens of conferences across the United States, we, or across Washington State. It's incredibly popular. I see it in our commercials. I see it in our history. I see Bigfoot everywhere. And he gave me like an LOL or some, maybe a curse word back. But the idea was that, that it is part of who we are and part of kind of Washington State's history. If you take any photos, if you want to talk, join in. Let's talk. WashingtonBigfoot.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. You can email me, and we can talk at any time. I've kind of developed up a, 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 a tag. My goal of this is just to get people who are interested in, in Bigfoot and who hear and see and want to kind of curate the ideas and kind of go forward and kind of share and kind of understand what they are. There's people who just want to read a book. There's people who do week-long camping adventures. There's people who want to go out and do casts and want to know how to do those. There's people who, who do all sorts of different parts. And I don't think any one of them makes us less interested or less like passionate about, about Bigfoot. And so just to kind of understand that whatever it is that interests you, like just kind of dig into it. And, and there's so much Washington State Bigfoot in, out there and just to enjoy it. Um, that's my presentation for the day. <laughs>